Hey guys and girls, John Grimsmo here, bringing you yet another wicked awesome Knife Making Tuesday. So this week I want to talk about something called carbidizing. Um, this is a process done to titanium frame lock knives, and probably liner locks too, that um, <clears throat> deposits a layer of tungsten carbide on the end of the lock bar. Uh, why do you do that, you might ask? Well, a typical problem when you have a stainless steel blade, or a steel blade, and a titanium handle, is that when you open it up, sure it locks up, nice and strong, but this is the lock bar here, you can see it bends over, this is how it works. It bends over and then right there, let's get some more light here. You can see it bends over and gets in the way of the blade. <clears throat> that prevents the blade from closing. Genius design, etc. Except when it's bare titanium onto the steel blade, it sticks. I, I can't get this out with my finger. Like I just set this up a few minutes ago. So this is the first, uh, you know, one of the first few flips. Um, so at this point, you know, I need a little flathead screwdriver and I go in there and I just pop it out. Um, so it's really common for locks to stick like that and you know especially if you go to a knife show and you go flip a hundred different knives uh, quite a few of them are going to be sticky like that and it sucks it's kind of unacceptable um, and for my knives it's utterly unacceptable I want no stickage whatsoever um, you know you talk to some makers at the show and they're like I like it to be sticky because it shows that it's working <clears throat> but then like, if you flip the knife open and you need two hands to undo it, and you need to hold your hand like this to undo it, that's a waste of time. It's meant for your thumb to be able to get in there, I can't even do it, and undo it. And if it's sticky, you can't do that. So how do we fix that? Carbidizing. But, there are tricks. And I'm going to show you some of my tricks to eliminate stickage, even with carbidizing. Um, <clears throat> Alright, so carbidizing puts a layer of carbide, tungsten carbide, on the end of the lock face. And not only does it help prevent stickage, but it also, um, since carbide is so hard, it improves the length and the wear time of the titanium lock face. It'll help it last longer, theoretically. Obviously, first thing, gotta take it apart. Here's one of my handles, here's the end of the lock bar. lock bar. So this is the end of my lock bar. You can see this little dented darker section right there. That's the actual lock up contact point. Okay, not this whole face, not down here, not on the inside, this little corner. And you gotta get your tolerances just right, and angles and contact points and everything, just right so that this little corner um, is doing the lockup. You know, check all of your high-end knives, the hinderers and the Chris Reeves and all that. Um, they're all going to contact in the top corner. That's the way to make it work. Emerson's and all that. Emerson even has a little section on his website that describes how and why to do that. So it's very handy information. Like on my lock bar, you can see there's quite a bit of milling chatter. Uh, just because the way I do it, I have to use a long end mill, and it kind of bounces around a little bit. But that's okay, because I'm carbonizing it smooth. So let's go see how I do that. So as far as I know, there are two commercial carbonizing systems you can buy. Um, one is a really expensive, really awesome one. I think it's made by Rocklin Manufacturing or something like that. If I find the link, I'll put it in. Um, it's like thousands of dollars. The other one is... Uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but I will put it in once I figure it out. Um, I think it's sold at Traver's Tool, and it's like $150 or something like that. Um, that's what most guys get, I think, and it's probably worth the money. If you're a little bit adept with um, electronics and can figure out what to do with a capacitor and a bridge rectifier, then you can obviously make your own, like what I did. This is a Mastec um, from Mastec.com. Uh, Variac, 0 to 250 volts, it's just got a turning knob, so it 
inputs 120 volts AC and it outputs 250 volts AC. So this is one that I put together myself with the Variac and then a little magic box with goodies inside. Uh, it's very simple inside. Don't worry about this light bulb holder. Uh, that was an original project. Don't, don't need that anymore. Kind of pointless now. I also use this for my titanium anodizing. So it gives me 0 to 150 volts of uh, DC voltage for titanium anodizing. You really only need 0 to 100. So inside, uh, it looks messier than, than it needs to be because it's got more stuff than it needs to have. The brains of the operation are a bridge rectifier. This converts um, AC voltage to DC voltage. It's just got four pins on it. Really simple, really cheap. They're a couple bucks. And then a capacitor. This is a 200 volt 1000 UF capacitor. It's just got two wires on it. You solder uh, positive to negative. Um, so I believe I go Variac power to the bridge rectifier, converts it to DC voltage. The capacitor smooths out the signal so that you get a much smoother DC voltage. And then it just goes out through a switch on the front here and through a voltage gauge. This is just a really cheap voltage gauge I got off of eBay. I guess it measures 0 to 200 volts or something. Yeah, 200 volts. They're like 5 or 10 bucks on eBay. They're really cool. Um, yeah, and then there's a little converter board in there that for some reason I decided to use that. I don't know. Um, the digital display needs 5 or 10 volts, whatever it needs. 5 volts. Um, so I just got a little wall wart right here to power that. That's about it. So there's more wiring than it needs to be. Um, this is a... Uh, what's it called? A resistor... I forget what kind of resistor. It's a heavy duty one. Um, it's, I'm going to use it as my bleed resistor, which comes in really handy. Um, so here I've got a, a two position switch. So off is in the middle, and then power is on that side, and drain is on this side. And what that does is zero is off, obviously. Power allows power through all the circuitry and then out to my leads, which I have right here. And then the drain um, puts the power the other way and basically drains it through this resistor. And this resistor can take a lot of heat because it's a metal core power resistor. That's what they're called. Yeah, this power resistor. Um, this is settings of 0 .0, or 0 0.01 ohms, 1%, 25 watts. So that's what this is. Um, I bet you the actual rating doesn't really matter as long as it's kind of big enough. Because this system, the capacitor... And uh, and everything will store the voltage. Even if you if you turn this to off and turn the power down to zero, it'll still store you know 100 volts in the wires and everything. And if you touch them both with your hands, you will get electrified. Um, it's not fun. And you can also do sparking and bad stuff like that, and it can ruin your anodizing. Um, so anywho. The power or the drain resistor, I installed that after about a year of using this, and it's it's wicked. We use it all the time. So it might look like a mess of wires, but once you start to understand the electronics behind it, um, it's literally just a bridge rectifier, goes to the capacitor, uh, piggybacks to the digital display so you can tell the voltage, goes to the switch, goes out, and then part of the switch goes back to the drain, and then drains. So hopefully you can figure that out, otherwise just go buy the commercial unit and be happy. So to prove my point, if you can read the dirty display, um, plug the power in for the Variac, we can go up to 25 volts, and you can get 0.1 uh, volt resolution which is nice. Say, and then, so if I go like up to 50 volts, turn it down, this is off now, it's still at 61 volts, draining very slowly, it takes a while. So this is off, and then if I hit the drain button, it cycles all that power through the power resistor, and now it's uh, golden again. Now the wires are safe. But otherwise, I'll show you an experiment. 
Um, so 38 volts, variac is off. Um, right now the switch is at zero, so these won't spark. Let's go back a little bit. So these won't spark, but if you're having to stay on the power setting, um, this will spark pretty good. There. And that's how we used to drain the power and have to spark it, and it's kind of dumb and dangerous. So then coming out a bit further, out the front, all I have is just two wires, positive and negative wires to a um, sleeve, just to keep it nice and straighter. And then coming out red and black wires with little alligator clips. After, you know, two years of use, these are getting pretty rusty. Not from carbonizing, but from anodizing with the sulfuric acid and stuff. So we gotta get new ones of these, preferably bigger and stronger ones. But anyway, for carbonizing, yep, this is what you need. Same for titanium anodizing. Alright, so here's my setup. I just used this vise. Um, here's one that I already did. I did it just before filming, and then I'm like, hey, I should do a video about this. So the surface there has been carbonized. This one has not. This is the one we were looking at before. So to prevent scratching with the handles, I put a little paper towel around it. Put it about there. Crank it down. Negative wire goes to the handle. So I clip it in through the clip holes right there. Seems to work really good and doesn't scratch up anything. And then the magic is a Dremel engraver. Doesn't have to be a Dremel brand, whatever you want. Uh, apparently I always leave it on the one setting. So an engraver works by vibrating the tip. Um, I don't really know if it goes in and out or around or... It probably goes in and out. What do I know? Yeah, not exactly quiet, but it works great. Um, and it comes with little carbide tips, but I just use um, like leftover end mills because I use end mills all the time and they break. They're carbide, so I just break them clean off and then shove them in the holder and boom, I got an infinite supply of carbide rods. So you can see the tip has been flattened through use. And I like having a nice wide flat tip so that uh, I can I can scrape the end of the lock bar nice and flat and even. <clears throat> so yeah, it's it's a completely unmodified Dremel engraver and then all I do is take the power wire and clip it to the front. Done. I've heard of some people like splitting this open and actually wiring it in professionally. And that's what that $150 one from Travers has. It's like they just took an off-the-shelf Dremel and then tore it apart and soldered a wire in and comes with a power supply. Like, it's a pretty slick setup. Um, but this is like 40 bucks, and the Mastec is like 50 bucks, and then your junk is, uh, you know, $10, $20. So you're kind of looking at well over $100 plus your time anyway. And if this one's like 150 or maybe it's 220 I don't know. You'll figure it out. It's kind of worth it, especially if you don't want to um, waste your time figuring that out. But anyway, this has worked for us for two years. I don't see any reason to change it, and I love it. So, uh, another side benefit of the paper towel is that it sort of isolates the metal vise from the negative ground. So if I happen to touch these, they're not actually conducting. Hasn't really been a problem, but you never know. Now I gotta figure out an angle to film this at so you can actually see what's going on without me getting in the way. For carbonizing, I have found that 40 volts is perfect. I used to try 20 and 30 and whatever. I love 40 volts. I haven't tried any higher. It might give you a bigger crystallized structure, but I like 40. And conveniently enough, um, when you use this and use it always at the same setting and especially this that kind of draws a lot of current there's a little notch I can feel a little notch in the turning in all the windings inside so without even looking I know that that's 40 volts because that's where the notch is and it's 42 now that's fine
Um, for carbonizing, the only safety equipment I use is a pair of safety glasses, just because. Um, <clears throat> although it's it's kind of a form of welding, you don't really need a welding mask because it stinks a tiny little bit, but it's more like like ions in the air or whatever. I don't know, I'm making that up. But um, yeah, it doesn't really have any splatter or spray or anything like that, so <clears throat> I don't even wear gloves. Like, I can hold the engraver and hold the handle away, and it doesn't shock me or anything. So, this flat is worn in at a, like, perfect angle for me to just, my hand is always in this position, resting right here, and I can, I can sort of feel the flat and get it nice and even. Alright, so I got my voltage on, I got the power switch turned to power. I'll need to turn this on, so it's going to be super loud, the engraver, so I might just lower the volume for that and not narrate during... Or I might voice over. Yeah, I should do that. But remember, this little corner, this front corner right there, is the only corner that matters. That's the only corner that's touching the knife. And uh, on the hinderer knives that I've seen, he only carbonizes that little tiny corner. Which is fine, because that's all you need to do. For consistency's sake, I like to do this whole flat. Just because. No real reason. Just because. That way, if anybody ever kind of looks in there going, is this carbonized, it's super obvious. All right, let's do this. So I like to start in the back where, whoops, start in the back where it doesn't really matter and then uh, work my way forward so that I get the angle right, I get my feel right, the pressure and everything. Um, I don't really push a lot of pressure on it yet. Near the end I do kind of smooth it out and put some pressure on it, but that way I have some experience on this exact handle with the angle and everything before I get to the important part. So you can see at the end I was pushing pressure on it, on the important spot, and just smoothing it out. Oops. It's still got power. I haven't drained it yet. It's tricky trying to remember all your own tricks while filming. Um, so yeah, I was smoothing out, you know, the important part and just getting it nice and flat and nice and even. Because it's depositing carbide on there in a really grainy, sandy texture. and you know, you want it to be kind of as smooth as, as you can. Otherwise you'll get even worse sticking. So that little spark at the end, I'm going to have to smooth that out again. There. Variac off, drain the power. We're good to go. All right. Now that bad boy is carbonized. Let's see how I do the negative here. Yeah, it's warm, obviously. Uh, I can still touch it, but sometimes it's too hot to touch. There's a good view. So as you can see, from the other surfaces compared to the carbonized surface, it's got a layer of bumpy stuff on it. So that's basically welded on there, um, carbide deposits, totally welded on there. And uh, when you anodize it, it does anodize a color, so it kind of hides itself a little bit. <clears throat> but yeah, that's the basis behind the magic there. 
Um, I've given you a few of my tricks, and there's one more that I'm going to give you uh, as a token of my appreciation for all the support and viewership. And all the knife makers watching this, especially the new guys that don't know how to do this, um, this will help save you a lot of headaches. So aside from, obviously, my Tormac, which is my favorite tool in the shop, this is definitely one of my favorite tools in the shop. 3M scotch Bright. 7S finish um, scotch bride wheel. Get it from Jantz or knifemaking.com, same place. Um, this is our second one after two years. Here's our first one. Eric and I absolutely love this tool. So awesome. So we use it for everything. It's the best. Go buy one right now. Um, yeah, just got it mounted up on an old furnace motor that I found in the basement, literally. Made a little adapter good to go. After carbonizing, you can't see it, but if I drag my finger along here, there's a burr. Right at this, this corner right there. And I'll show you on my <clears throat> top secret prototype. Um, <clears throat> um, this area before it gets up on the ball, if you see the little lock bar, now it's bouncing up on the ball. This area before the ball is where that burr is going to cause you headaches. It's going to scrape and feel like crap. So we got to smooth that out. So this little burr. So I'm going to scotch bite that off. I'm going to scotch bite this corner off because it's really sharp. I'm going to bend this out of the way and scotch bite this past corner and this angle right here without messing up the finish. And then my secret weapon is to use the scotch bright wheel to actually scotch bright the face of the carbide of the carbidize. Not a lot, just to smooth it out. Actually, yeah, I'll get my USB microscope and show you in detail what's going on here. Alright, check this out. USB microscope. I've shown this before, but I need to do more videos with this because it's just pretty cool. The quality kind of sucks, but it gets the point across and it lets you get really close. Like 20 bucks on eBay, really fun. Look at your fingerprints and buggers and whatever, the kids love it. Okay, so I'm going to look in close at the, um, you know, lock face with this microscope. Alright, here's what the carbonized face looks like. You can see the fresh machine side. And then move over to the carbonized side. Yeah, the quality kind of sucks, but but we can get super close. Anyway, you can imagine all those deposits are little peaks and valleys, little pointy bits that um, are quite sharp on a microscopic scale and uh, pretty abrasive, like, like a sheet of sandpaper. Um, so if you just go right from that and put it on the knife, it's going to have all those little points that are just going to dig into the end of the knife and um, probably be pretty gritty and might even stick worse than before. Maybe not. I think a lot of guys just run it as is and eventually it breaks in. But uh, I don't want a knife to break in eventually. I want it to be perfect when I send it out. Alright, bonus points to anyone who can figure out what we're microscope looking at right now. So what I do to smooth these guys out is I get that inside edge first on the side of the wheel. Then I just get all the corners and then I bend it out with my and I bend it out with my finger and I get the face just like that. Carefully don't go too much so that you don't uh, cut all the carbide off. You just want to smooth it out. You just want to smooth off all those little sharp peaks. Then I drag my finger across here, my fingernail, to make sure it's nice and smooth. Because one little tiny grain will make it feel like crap.
So then we go back to assembly. I've got this one. They're both carbonized. This one I just scotch brighted. This one I didn't scotch bright. So let's put together the non scotch brighted one. It's not bad actually, it's a little gritty. So for it being the non-scotch breaded one, it's just a little bit gritty. I need more tension on the lock bar for that one. But then for the scotch breaded one, hopefully it should go together perfectly. Sometimes I have to go back and scotch bread a few times. And if it's still sticky, I have to even uh, recarbonize. I've had to do that a few times, no big deal. Alright, so now I've scotch brighted both of the lock faces, and they are super smooth. No stick whatsoever. So this one's got about 50% lock up. Usually I try to for 25 to 50 percent. This one just happened to be a little bit more. This one's more like 35 maybe. I don't know. 25 to 50 makes me happy. So the other um, <clears throat> last point I wanted to make about carbonizing is you know how I said some people like a sticky lock, like some makers like to stick. Um, and I think that could also be due to the lock face geometry. The way that this bar <clears throat> interacts with the tang of the blade. You know, there's a lot of tiny little um, angles and variations going on there. And if you do it right, it'll lead to a very strong lock. If you do it wrong, it'll lead to a very slippy lock. You know, and you don't want to be using the knife and have it close on you. Um, due to a poor lock, so thankfully I've done enough trial and error to uh, get a really good geometry so that I don't need much preload. I don't need a lot of stickiness here, if any at all, in order for the knife to lock up really tight. You know, I've had some that are 10 or 15 percent lock up with a lock bar that's super light, moves over super easy, but uh, I can spine whack the crap out of it and it won't close on me. Don't believe me? Perfect. Alright guys, thanks for watching. That's carbonizing.